And from reading the book, it really did sound like it was this real kind of adventure full of people with highs and lows. Despite all this amazing support that you had, um, there's, there's guys like Liam Glasper, um, he says, did you ever doubt yourself? And Anita Bullen and Paul Hammer said, did you have any moments when you just wanted to give up? And, and if so, what kept you going? I would say every day I doubted myself. Um, there wasn't a time, you know, because again, it, I went through these highs and lows, so I'd have times where I was feeling great, and then I would have other times where I'd feel low, um, and there were definitely times where I told Jenny, like, let's just go home. This is this is stupid. It's pushing us too far. Um, you know, she kind of just, it was too much on her, and I felt bad that you know, she was pushed. So, um, definitely. And, and you're going to have those times, whatever you're doing in life, where you just don't think you can do what you're trying to do. And you have to press on. And some days it was just a matter of having my friends uh, tell me like, hey, you just got to go and do this. And so I just get back out there. And even if it was just hobbling and walking with two injured legs, um, that's what I did. And I think that's, that's what you have to do is you have to find some kind of drive, something that can pull you um, onward. And so that drive for you, how you've done a lot of things like seven wins at Western States and and the Bad Water as well. And and Alan Risk and Sally Gilson want to they just want to know how you keep on motivating yourself after everything that you've already achieved. I think North does the book definitely. They'll have to read the book because it definitely touches yeah. on this. But what would you say yeah. in a nutshell? I'd say find new challenges. For me, the Appalachian Trail was so new and. Just like Badwater and Spartathlon, they were road events. I preferred mountains. Um, so don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. I think that's something that I've uh, really learned a lot from is you know try new challenges, um, maybe even try a new sport or try, try something that really gets you away from what you're familiar with. And the Appalachian Trail and doing multi-days was something I, I was kind of new at in, in some regards. Hadn't done a lot of that. So... Um, yeah, don't be afraid to try something new or put a tweak um, or a change on something that has become old. That's fantastic advice. And, and in a similar vein, Kane Pritchett wants to know um, if and how you deal with aborted runs due to not being mentally prepared, or are you always ready? No, there's been times, and this is where um, North starts out with, you know, Jenny really kind of getting after me, like, you know, she had seen me and it crewed for me in races. And that's why her reluctance, as much as she was supportive, her reluctance was like, oh, no, especially a weekend, like, you're injured. Oh, here we go again. She had seen me drop out of races. And aborted runs were something that was happening a lot in my career um, the last couple of years. And so I think, for me, I was in still a good place mentally. I wasn't, you know, oh, gosh, you know, I'm totally losing. But I also didn't have that fire and drive. And so... Um, I would say to that is you have to put perspective on it and not not beat yourself up too much, but also figure out a way, how could I get through that next time? Um, what could be different? Um, so I'm always trying to reassess the situation um, and figure out, okay, going forward, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that would be helpful too. Um, don't beat, your, beat yourself up. You can be sad and depressed about it for a little bit, but you got to come out of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's all a learning experience, isn't it? Every DNF, yeah. Definitely. They're, they're not easy, for sure. Yeah. And um, Courtney Pepper again, she just wants to know, what was your maximum and minimum sleep or your average on the trail? And did you take naps? Oh, I was, you know, taking naps on rocks and sleeping anywhere <laughs> I could. I mean, I'd sleep 10 minutes here, half hour there. But um, in fact, to the point where I could sleep just about anywhere on the trail. Um, average sleep, you know, started out at five to six hours, and that just, it got shorter and shorter as the trail ran. I mean, halfway through, I was lucky if I was getting four to five. Um, late, the last two weeks, I was getting two hours of sleep, tops typically, sometimes three. Um, and then the last night, I was getting one hour. I went around the clock a couple of times uh, with no sleep until I slept, um, you know, for a couple hours. So, it really varied, but I would say average sleep during the whole journey is really hard to, to digest, and it would be um, staggeringly low for the number of days. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it probably averaged around four hours of sleep per night, um, which is kind of crazy when you think about it for that long. And that's where the sleep deprivation, I'd never felt sleep deprivation on that level ever before. What does it feel like? Uh, it feels like... Um, 
it feels like I was in a fog a lot of times. Um, I was still very sharp, like my senses were, you know, in tune with my surroundings. I got very good at being sharp, but then there were other times where I'd be so sleepy, I was still walking down these crazy pitches, um, slabs of rocks, roots, and I would wake up, you know, falling asleep, scared out of my mind. So it was like this, um, it was this somewhere between being somewhat really sharp, foggy, and then also on the other end of the spectrum, I was, you know, totally out of it to the point where I was falling asleep when I was going down very serious terrain. So, um, yeah, it was a very interesting uh, kind of point. And also I got really good at being able to recharge. I could sleep sometimes for just a few minutes and it felt like I'd slept for a couple hours. Um, so my body was able, in my mind, were able to be totally restful. And I think that's that's an interesting part of sleep research that, you know, for people with serious insomnia, like how can they get the best amount of sleep for the shortest amount of time versus tossing and turning? So um, as much as we know, it'd be ideal if we got seven, hours of sleep every night um you know how could people who do have difficulty falling asleep or waking up all the time how could get they maximize that short window they might have so it's it's a fascinating thing I, that's one thing i came away from it being like you know, i can't believe how some people function you know whether they're you know their job requires them to be awake for hours on end or um you know people that have real serious you know insomnia and, and how they deal with that on a regular basis yeah, it's insane, isn't it? I was, I really felt for you when you were going across those cliff edges and you were like, guys, I really need to sleep just now. I'm worried I'm going to fall off. Yeah. yeah. And it, really went, it came down, if I wanted the record, I couldn't sleep. So um, that's where it was really hard for my buddy Tover and, and Chrissy Mail. Like, I never remember they both, um, at one point, they were just in tears because, and they didn't show me the tears, but they would tell Jenny and um, the rest of my crew, they were just like, you know, I don't know if we pushed them too far. And, you know, that's the, the one thing as like friends and as crew, you, it, it's always that fine balance of how far do you push your, your friend, your family member um, to get that extra ounce out. And so you have to, you, there's a, a double edged sword there. You, know, you want them to succeed, but you also don't want to damage them. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> it really, really felt from the book that it was a total team effort. And so Andrea Sexton said, can you ask about support crew and how important they are? Yeah, it's it's different for everybody. And as I write in North, um, it's unique. Some spouses or partners um, or friends might not be able to do what Jenny did or some of my other buddies like Speak Up and, and Horty did. Um, so you need to find those people and make sure that they understand what you're trying to do. Um, they have an, at least an understanding of, okay, when he's feeling like this, I might need to do this differently or I'd be able to appreciate that. And I think that's really key. Communication is really key. Um, you should communicate beforehand um, so that when you get in certain situations, they know like, oh yeah, don't mention this. Or, <laughs> you know, I should, you know, give her this when she's asking, you know, like, you definitely want to know that um, Jenny's really good about giving tough love, and I think Carl and Horty too. As much as I would, you know, you know, kind of almost have this battle with them of like, oh no, this is the way I'm doing it. Um, you have to do things your own way, but also listen. Um, and I think that's that's hard sometimes when you're in the heat of the moment trying to achieve something. It's real easy to just kind of like, nope, I'm going to be stubborn and do it my way. But I think you have to be open uh, to other ideas, and then. I think have an eclectic mix of individuals. I mean, Hordy's one of those guys where, um, you know, it's not a, the easiest to be around all the time. And he, he loves to joke about it that way too. Like he can be a pain in the ass. I think <laughs> sometimes you need those people that can be a pain in the ass. Um, sometimes you need the, you know, the numbers guy like Speedgoat. I mean, he, he's a real numbers and he brought a lot of knowledge, um, but he's very like cut and dry. Like you're wasting time. You know, you need to pare this down. So, um, you need all of those people, and then you need your, um, I need my buddies, too, that were just fun to be around. My buddy Walter, you know, who could just, you know, tell me about what's going on with his love life or whatever he was, like, going on, like, just to take my mind off of that discomfort. So I think you need you need the comedian. Uh, my buddy Timmy, he was, like, my jester for 10 days, um, as well as, like, he was my, you know, uh, my, like, spiritual counselor. He was always, like, giving me. So I think you kind of need that whole eclectic mix. It's, it's like you need... You need everybody, and you need everybody doing their job. Um, and we have we had fun doing it. We did a lot of hard, um, gnarly, crazy stuff. Um, 
out there on the Appalachian Trail, and it was miserable at times, but then we also had a lot of fun, too. And we, we found the fun in misery, which is, which is hard to do sometimes. That is a skill in itself, isn't it? And so with that all in mind, would you do something like this again? Um, I definitely want to do something again like this. I'm finally, this is where a lot of people are like, recovery-wise, how long does it take to recovery and or for recovery? And physically, um, you know, it was about four to six months, but I'd say mentally, um, I was, you know, still, even last year, like, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to do something again, but now I'm, I'm feeling ready, uh, hopefully next year. We've got a, a couple of uh, young kids that'll be running around as well in the van, and uh, it'll get a little crazy, but Jenny is uh, excited to do something as well. So we're, we actually, writing about it was way harder than doing it, so um, if we can take a break after this whole writing and, and sharing our stories, which we love to do, but um, the writing was way harder, so... We'll, we'll gladly take the Appalachian Trail and uh, gladly take uh, another challenge uh, next time. I thought it was funny what Aaron said, that it took you however many days to complete it, and then it took you the same amount of weeks to write it. <laughs> it yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the, the, the one thing. Is, it's interesting to, to think of it that way. But, yeah, it's, it's a very – and that's, again, a different type of challenge to take on after writing one book. I knew what it took, but it was really hard to like, okay, I want to do this again. And we're glad we did it. It was very uh, rewarding, but um, writing with your partner uh, is a whole other <laughs> level. And, and with a with a one and a half year old running around and you know, you're trying sleepless nights, um, I felt like the sleep deprivation uh, was on another level with the book writing because <laughs> that's when we could get the work done. So, um, but we're, uh, we're excited to finally share the story and, and made the best book possible. I think it's a brilliant book. I really genuinely thought it was really well written. I loved the bits from Jenny as well. She's just so oh, like well, she, plucky she and was, courageous. She's amazing. Oh, definitely. And she, you know, she's the reason the journey um, happened uh, from the beginning. She was the reason it happened every day, and she kept me going. And she was uh, also a reason that the book, I think, had the flavor that it had because her viewpoint was important. Um, there were two separate things happening. There was my life on the trail, and then there was the life that she led in supporting me, and um, she had her own set of stories, so we, we really tried to weave it together. It's not easy to do two voices and have them come in and out at the same time, so um, it was quite challenging, but we're, we're glad we did it, and we hope everyone enjoys that perspective. Yeah, it's exquisitely woven, really is, and I love the way you describe things and the way she describes things, and I just love the fact that you guys were so honest as well, like, it's almost painful to read sometimes, and you just want to, like, scoop both of you up and go, just just have a sleep and stop, but it was really, really good. I can't recommend the book enough. It's a really, really great read. If people read nothing else this year, they should go read it. Um,